Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing the idea of artificial photosynthesis, something that the nature has been trying to evolve and improve for billions of years, and something that in the last few decades, we humans have improved even more. And specifically, I wanted to focus on at least a few recent studies where the scientists have found brilliant ways of essentially allowing photosynthetic plants to grow in complete darkness, overall improving the efficiency of growth as well, and even created what the scientists refer to as cyborg bacteria that are able to photosynthesize a lot more efficiently than pretty much anything else in natural existence. But this idea of artificial photosynthesis is obviously not new. It's been in existence for quite a long time and has been used for a lot of different reasons. And so in this video, I only wanted to focus on some of these recent discoveries and only some of these reasons. But we'll be discussing more advancements and more discoveries in some of the future videos as well. And so anyway, photosynthesis, what is it in a nutshell? I mean, in case you completely forgot based on the biology in high school. Well, as a broad definition, photosynthesis involves two different steps. There is the light sensitive step, and in this case, it's usually the proton or the hydrogen from water being captured into the next cycle, with the oxygen being released as a byproduct. Although even here, these light-dependent reactions can vary quite a lot depending on the organism and do involve a lot of extra steps, followed by the second light-independent reaction, which normally captures CO2 and by using the previously captured hydrogen, then starts to produce all kinds of sugars and all kinds of molecules that represent food for a typical organism. And obviously even here, there is quite a lot of diversity and quite a lot of very complex reactions as well. In more chemical terms, there are two different half reactions. There is the oxidation reaction followed by the reduction reaction. And both of them are essential for the production of fuel afterwards. And typically, the light is used to photooxidize water molecules to release oxygen and to produce hydrogen protons. Whereas the second stage, very often referred to as the Kelvin cycle, does not actually need any light, and here it converts carbon dioxide into different types of glucose, different types of sugars, and basically food for the plant or for the organism that's photosynthesizing. And when it comes to ideas of artificial photosynthesis, here the scientists normally focus on one of these two steps, either to improve the light reaction or to improve the formation of glucose and various types of sugars. Although ultimately the idea is to try to combine both and to make both of them way more efficient. And that's because despite billions of years of evolution, unfortunately photosynthesis has not reached the most efficient levels. As a matter of fact, it is not efficient at all. With some plants being more efficient than other plants, and some organisms only being able to successfully use approximately 1% of the solar power, with the average being about 3 to 6%. And that's not a lot at all, because even your typical solar panel right here will usually have efficiency of at least 6%, up to about 20%, with some of the lab devices often even having 40% efficiency. And if this has more efficiency than what nature has created in billions of years, there's definitely some room for improvement. And there are actually quite a lot of inefficiency when it comes to photosynthesis. Just to give you one example, one of them is because of the evolution. For example, we know that when early bacteria was still evolving photosynthesis early on, such as the purple bacteria, there was not a lot of oxygen on the planet. This is also when the extremely important protein known as Rubisco, that's usually responsible for the second step of photosynthesis in most life, was also evolved as well. You can learn a little bit more about this from one of the older videos in the description. And so back then, the oxygen was not actually affecting anything in the chemical reaction. But as oxygen became more prominent, especially after the great oxygenation event, it started to interfere with the chemical reactions that were already established inside various photosynthetic organisms. And so, for example, right here, where Rubisco is supposed to capture carbon dioxide, sometimes it can also grab oxygen by mistake. And when it does so, instead of producing healthful sugars, it can sometimes end up producing glycolic acid or different types of glycolates. And this ends up in dramatically reducing the efficiency of this process, because glycolates are sort of seen as a kind of a toxic waste. And so, some of the mechanism has to then be used to dismantle the glycolates and to even release some of the materials along with carbon dioxide that could be used otherwise. This ends up reducing that second step by at least 40% efficiency, and that's of course just a natural reaction and a natural process that happens in everything on Earth. 
And so in the last years, some of the studies have tried to solve this by even resorting to certain ideas from the genetic engineering. But that's just one of many deficiencies of photosynthesis. Here's another one. Sometimes when the sunlight gets way too strong, the plant needs to cool down in order to avoid damage. And this process of light quenching can take minutes or even hours in order to turn off the primary machinery responsible for the light-based reactions. But if suddenly there are more clouds covering the skies and the conditions improve, it will still take at least a few minutes to possibly a few hours to then restart everything, once again reducing the efficiency quite dramatically. And so there are some really impressive projects out there, such as this one right here known as the C4 RISE project, that essentially try to find solutions in bypassing some of these natural reactions and thus improving the overall growth of plants and the overall photosynthesis. Now we're not really going to be talking about this particular project just yet, but in a nutshell, it's an attempt to genetically modify rice plants to bypass some of these natural photorespiration responses in order to improve the efficiency of rice by at least 50%. And because rice is the biggest staple food on the planet, it will thus improve the efficiency of growth of rice for a lot of different communities on the planet. This project is currently actually doing really well, and so I wanted to dedicate some of the future videos to explain exactly what they're doing. But the whole point I'm trying to make is that, naturally, photosynthesis is actually not efficient at all, and it does have a lot of issues to deal with because of the way that our planet evolved in the last few billions of years. But in these two new studies that I'm going to be discussing right now, the scientists were able to improve each one of these individual steps, making each one of them more efficient, and in theory, applying both of them to maybe any plant out there, with one of these projects already winning one of the awards from NASA itself. And the first advance is visible behind me. This is the image of what the scientists refer to as a cyborg bacteria. Bacteria that was engineered to become even more efficient at capturing sunlight. Now, by default, some bacteria have a very interesting natural defense, where if certain metals are introduced into the environment, they'll turn these heavy metals into various sulfides, expressing them on their surface. And so in this case, when the scientists grew these bacteria by introducing tiny particles of cadmium, these bacteria started to produce cadmium sulfide crystals on the outside of their bodies the particles that are known to be photosensitive. And as a result, this doesn't just turn these bacteria into photosynthetic bacteria, but it actually makes them extremely efficient at producing acetic acid, vinegar, from nothing but CO2, water, and light. And the efficiency here was extremely high, approximately 80%, which is roughly around twice as high as the most efficient solar panel, and over 10 times more efficient than any known plant. And so in this case, these cyborg bacteria were essentially perfect for generating huge amounts of acetate, which though might not sound very useful, is actually useful for several different species. But that's of course just one example of producing acetic acid. But this particular research connects very well with the next research that was actually only released a few weeks ago. In this case, the scientists were able to create a kind of a hybrid system where they first created an electrolysis system with solar panels electrolyzing water to create oxygen and acetate, but then grew various types of plants and various types of mushrooms and algae in complete darkness, producing food completely independent of any solar activity or any light. Or to rephrase this, they were able to grow several species by feeding it acetate, allowing these organisms to grow in complete darkness. Something that didn't just work, but turned out to be even more efficient than growing the same plants under light conditions. Discovering that several kinds of mushrooms were actually thriving in these conditions, and normally these mushrooms and these fungi would usually work in collaboration with another plant, but also discovering several types of algae, such as this one right here known as Chlamydomonas, which normally only work in sunlight, but in this case were growing just fine in complete darkness in flasks of acetate. And as you can see right here, the right flask seems to have way more algae than the left flask. The right flask was actually grown in the dark. The left one was grown in regular conditions. But when applied to various more complex plants, such as lettuce, it would only grow to a certain point, suggesting that sunlight was still required for certain reactions, but the scientists are not certain which ones, suggesting that a solution here can be either some kind of a genetic engineering technique, or maybe a different chemical can be synthesized and used alongside acetate, but which one, we're not really certain yet. 
But the important discovery here once again is that all of this was way more efficient than using natural photosynthesis under natural light conditions. And more importantly, all of this could then be combined with previously mentioned cyborg bacteria to first produce huge amounts of acetate and to then use this to produce large amounts of biomass that will require this acetate to function. Because each of these two important steps of photosynthesis were individually improved in each of these studies in each of these papers. And though the second paper in this case relied on the solar power to essentially produce the acetate, it would be a lot more efficient if they replaced this with that cyborg bacteria I previously mentioned. And in this case, this study has already made it to phase 2 of NASA investigation to produce food in space or on any future colony we might have somewhere outside of planet Earth. Implying, of course, that these are extremely important discoveries and if they're successful, or in other words, if these studies reach a point where they actually become a functional technology, it's quite possible that all of this will then make its way to our daily lives right here on planet Earth, providing food security for a lot of different communities out there and even allowing some crops to grow completely independently of sunlight in complete darkness. And as we've experienced this year, food security is still a huge issue on the planet even today, more so than ever before. So these particular studies are actually extremely important for the future of humanity as a whole. But these are just some of the discoveries from the last few years. We'll talk about more discoveries in some of the future videos, so make sure to subscribe, share this with someone who has learned about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find it in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, Bye-bye.